1981, the House of Representatives made a gathering and they decided, they put forth that the fourth Sunday of October, I mean the last Sunday of October, would be a national holiday, Mother-in-Law's Day. Check it out, I'm, I'm dead serious. Mother-in-Law Day, okay? okay? And so, I mean, it was never accepted by the Senate, but still, every year, there's about 800,000 cards mm -hmm. sold in honor of Mother-in-Law's Day. So I was talking to a friend about it, and we were talking about, you know, maybe why it, it didn't pick up. So he said to me, you know, how many days at the end of October can you devote to witches? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Not, um, that's not the reason, but whatever. <coughs> so Halloween. What's the history of Halloween? Is it a holiday that Jews are permitted to celebrate? And what are some practical lessons, practical insights that we can gain from these surrounding ideas that we're going to be talking about tonight? So the history of Halloween. Now, it wasn't always called Halloween, but the day set aside and the customs that surround it date back to ancient times, the very old holiday. Okay? Most, most historians trace it back to the 5th century BCE. Okay? Uh, it was an ancient Celtic holiday. The holiday was called So'on. It's pronounced many different ways, but the, the Celtic holiday was called So'on. Good. The only change over the centuries are the reasons for dressing up, lighting fires, and acting foolish. But now, you know, now when you celebrate Halloween, it's not a religious holiday per se. People, most people who are celebrating it are not doing it out of religious motives. It's mostly fun and mostly done by children. But originally, it was very serious, a very serious day, and primarily for adults. So it was a festival celebrated by the Celts, 5th century BCE, called Sao On. Um, when, we say, when we say Celts, that's spelled C-E-L-T-I-C, -E the Celtic people. Some people pronounce it Celtic. Either way is correct, either way is right. We'll call it Celtic so that we don't think of the Boston basketball team. Celtic. So on October 31st, what the Celts believed was that that was the end of the summer. And November 1st was New Year's and started the winter. And so you had all the, the heat and the light energy of summer coming to a close and the dark and scary, gloomy cold of the winter approaching. And the two were kind of at odds with each other. And on October 31st at night was like the merged, the blend of both of those energies. It was no longer the summer anymore with the light and the heat, but it was also not quite yet the dark and the cold of the winter. It was that middle ground and what they thought what it was also the middle ground of the physical world and the spiritual world, of positive energy in the world and negative energy in the world, of the living and of the dead. They believed that that night, spirits of people who had passed away would go lurking around in, in the towns and pick which human being, which animal, whatever, that soul, that spirit was going to inhabit for the upcoming year. In order to scare away the spirits, what did they do? They would dress up, right? Don't want to show my face, don't want the, the spirit to come after me. They would dress up, and they would dress up as witches, or as goblins, and they'd go around making a lot of noise and destruction to scare away the spirits that were going to come inhabit them. There was lots of bonfires uh, as well to elicit the gods, to protect them, or whatever. They had priests called druids. 
And these Druids had many rituals that they would do in order to protect the people that, uh, or, or sacrifices that they would make in order to prevent a person from being uh, captured by a demon or by a spirit. If a villager was deemed possessed, if you looked at somebody and decided, okay, this guy's possessed, he could, in theory, be offered as a human sacrifice in order to stray off other spirits don't you, don't you inhabit a human. Go to an animal, go to something else. But this is what's going to happen if you go to a human, where you're going to get sacrificed. It was in order to stray off the other spirits. These are people who were pagans. They worshipped many gods. Uh, they believed in uh, witches and fairies and all sorts of interesting things. They believed that witches could transform into black cats. Ever sound familiar a little bit? There was a custom also involving black cats on this holiday of Sao'on that it said that if you placed um, some milk in front of your house and the cat was able to drink, so it would bless you. It would bless your house. And if you didn't, it would curse you. This is kind of where that whole idea of if you cross a black cat and you don't have anything or whatever, it's bad luck. Okay. Again, as Jews, we don't believe in superstitions like this, but this is what they believed. One of the reasons that we're going into detail about th this holiday and its history, even though it's not a Jewish holiday, is to see really what its roots are, what it is when October 31st comes, what people are actually celebrating indirectly, and therefore we can make a, maybe a clear judgment in our own life about what type of energy we want to be associated with. Cats were also part of the divining, the, the, what the Druids would use when they would practice this magic. Cats played an active role. By the first century, the Roman Empire had conquered the majority of the Celtic territories. Okay? Over time, Two Roman festivals combined with Celtic celebration of, of uh, Sao'an. So the Romans kind of, when they took power, they integrated these old customs that were part of Ireland, that were part of this ancient Celtic holiday, and made it kind of part of their own. And some of the rituals, they added on some additional customs and rituals that got mishmashed into it. Two Roman holidays in particular are associated with what we call today Halloween. One is a day called Feralia. It's a day in late October that commemorated the passing of the dead. And the second one is called Pomona, named after a Roman goddess. who She was the goddess of the fruit and the trees. By the way, just a little interesting footnote, Pomona, this goddess, so to speak, she is symbolized by an apple. This probably, very likely, explains where the custom on Halloween came of bobbing for apples or eating candy apples. Okay? It, it's from Roman times. So we see some recognizable customs from when it was Celtic in its original state. And then once the, the Roman Empire spread and conquered over those Celtic lands, how it got mishmashed into the Roman culture, and they added and mishmashed some of their ideas together, all on this same day and centered around the same day, the same time. And then later, if you open your history books, the official religion of the Roman Empire became Catholicism, Roman Catholicism. And that was around the 300s, 325 AD. They had the Council of Nicaea. And that's when, essentially, the official religion of the Roman Empire became Roman Catholicism. So when Christianity swept the Roman Empire, many pagan rituals were incorporated into the church in order to ease conversion. You make, uh, you make it easy for people to transition into a new religion. You know, when you show up every year on a certain day, and you're used to having certain rituals that you do, and certain things and symbols that you see. So next year, when you come back, you want to see things looking about the way that they do, about the way that they did last year. It's very well known, 
and we'll probably talk about it more at length another time, that there's another holiday, December 25th, that's celebrated worldwide. Most Christian scholars know that that is not when the founder of Christianity's birthday was. It was merely a day that was already practiced as a, as a holiday, celebrating a certain pagan god. And that was the day that we're going to celebrate the birthday of our god. So a lot of rituals, a lot of former pagan rituals were incorporated into the church in order to make an easy, trans, uh, an easy transmission. Transition, excuse me. On May 13th, in the year 609, Common Era, the then Pope dedicated the Pantheon to Christian martyrs as opposed to the gods. They got rid of all the statues of the gods and they became statues of the Christian martyrs. It was dedicated instead to the Catholic Church. And the, Catholics, the Catholic feast of All Martyrs Day was established on May 13th. In the 8th century, Pope Gregory III moved it from May 13th to November 1st as a day to honor all the saints and all the martyrs. So the holiday, All Saints Day, incorporated some earlier traditions as well. The evening before All Saints Day, November 1st is October 31st, and was known as All Hallows' Eve. Later on, the church also adapted November 2nd as All Souls Day, okay, which revamped the Celtic Festival of the Dead. How did Halloween come to America? Where did it come from? It's, it was in Europe. Where did it come, how did it come to America? So the Irish immigrants, when they were fleeing potato famine in the early 1800s, brought their customs and their costumes uh, to America. All these rituals and, and uh, ideas that they had had these holidays they brought to America in the mid-1800s. The ancient Irish Celts had a custom to hollow out large turnips and carved uh, demon faces on, and lit the inside with a candle of turnips. When the settlers, the Irish immigrants, came to America, they found turnips very hard to find. But you know what they found a lot of? Pumpkin. A lot of pumpkins. <laughs> so from then on, the inside of the pumpkin became associated with autumn and thanksgiving pumpkin pie whatever and the outside of the pumpkin halloween even the term jack-o-lantern is from irish folklore the folk story goes that there was a man named jack who was known as a stingy drunkard and one time he convinced the devil to follow him up a tree and the devil chased him up a tree and when he was up there he trapped him and he wouldn't let him go and so the devil said you know that if you let me go I'm never gonna tempt you again you'll never have these temptations you're you're a bad guy I'll never tempt you again so he let him go whatever after his time after he passed away because he lived a very sinful life he wasn't allowed in heaven and when he went downstairs, the devil said, I'm not going to warm you up down here. You're going to have to roam around in the cold. So the, the folk legend from the Irish says that the devil gave him one uh, charcoal, one bit of one little amber, and, which he put inside of a turnip that he had bit and ha howled out through biting. And that was known as Jack's Lantern. And he, that's, he was condemned to like this uh, existence of just living uh, between in limbo and for the rest and just guided by this lantern. Jack-o'-lantern, that's where it comes from. The idea of trick-or-treating, the custom of trick-or-treating, likely dates back to the All Souls Day parades that they would have in England. During these festivities, poor citizens would beg for food from families Okay, and the families would give them pastry salt called soul cakes in return for the promise that these people, these peasants, would pray for their deceased relatives. The distribution of soul cakes was encouraged by the church as a way to replace the ancient practice of leaving food and wine for roaming spirits. 
the practice of going souling, or uh, as some people call it, wassailing. Right? Ever hear of that? It's very much connected with uh, the idea of caroling, going around home to home, um, caroling. So these are the origins of the holiday that now we call Halloween. The question is, how is a Jew supposed to look at it? Now that we really have a much better understanding of where this holiday comes from, what's our, what's our approach supposed to be? In Judaism, we believe something very special. Not everybody has to be a Jew. In fact, we're probably the only religion that exists in the world that doesn't mandate our way or the highway. What do we say instead? We have our role in creation. We have our job to do in this world. And you have your job. Us Jews, we have to do 613 commandments. Non-Jews have to uphold a, a moral society, the seven Noahide laws, in this week's Parsha, Parsha's Noah. And if they do what they're supposed to do, God says, I love you. Great job. And they have a front row seat in the next world as well. Jews have a little bit more responsibility to do. That's fine. Just like, think about a synagogue. In a synagogue, uh, it's also different than many of the other houses of worship. Usually, the leader in the house of worship, the priest, the pastor, the imam, whoever, okay, is head and shoulders above the congregation. I mean, he's holy and everyone else is eh, mediocre. He's like the key, the key or the, you know, the, the bridge to heaven. If you want to talk to God, you've got to go through this guy. Whereas in Judaism, the rabbi is just really not the holier guy, but just more knowledgeable, perhaps, than the rest of the congregation. The most qualified leader, the most qualified teacher, the most qualified uh, at making Jewish legal decisions, but not the most holy, per se. Just a different role. You have the rabbi and the congregation, and together they work together to make the, the synagogue, the house of worship, work. And it works a similar way with the Jewish people and the rest of humanity. We're not better than anybody, but we, had, we do have a very distinct role. We are meant to be God's messengers, God's ambassadors, God's rabbis, so to speak, teaching the rest of the world Torah as it is meant to be learned by them. Teaching all of humanity not to do, not that you have to be Jewish and that you better be Jewish, and if you're not Jewish, you're nothing. No. Instead, teaching them about morality, bringing the idea of one God to the world, and showing them what their purpose in this world really is. That being the case, we have a further idea. Being that we are physical people, and that which appears real to us is the physical world, it's very easy to get astray, to go astray from our actual mission. Our mission is a spiritual mission. Our mission is to look through the lens of Torah and see the godly spark within everything. And using the Torah as our guide, know how to interact with everything, know how to uplift the world around us. Those things which we're commanded to utilize, do them, to put on tefillin, to light Shabbat candles, etc. Those things that we're, through the lens of the Torah, told to abstain from, to abstain from those things. But, being that what's most real to us isn't always the godly glow in the room, it's more, more practically the hamburger in front of our eyes, it's very easy to be led astray both through temptation of physical objects, physical things, and ideologies as well. So the Torah tells us that we're supposed to make, in certain areas of our life, a fence, a little bit of a separation. Not that we're holding ourselves aloof, or that we think we're better than anybody, but if we're supposed to be God's role models in the world, you know, you ever have a role model in your life that you really looked up to? 
And the reason you looked up to him is because he wasn't exactly like you. He held him in a little higher esteem. And then, did you ever see that role model do something that you didn't expect this guy to be doing or this girl to be doing? And all of a sudden, your whole respect of them was lost. Because why? why? Because they weren't separating themselves. Because they didn't act as a, a role model, as an example. They were acting like you. I don't need, I don't need another guy like, like me around. I don't need to lead someone who was just like me. I need someone who's, uh, I hold her a little bit higher esteem. So too it works the same with the Jewish people. In order for us to be the proper influence that we're meant to be in this world, we have to be, in some areas of our life, a little bit separate, a little bit removed. We have to know our boundaries. And there's a whole system and a whole category of halacha, of Jewish law, called chukat akum. Things that are the ways of humanity, the ways of the non-Jewish world. And we're not meant to get involved in all of those things, all of their custom, all of their practices, and all of their ideologies. Now, I'd like to make a little disclaimer. And this disclaimer is also mentioned in the tshuvas of the Divrei Chaim. And he says, don't think for a second that this fence or this separation has anything to do with arrogance. It's just to emphasize our responsibility. The intent is not to cause a leniency in respect that's shown to our neighbors, our non-Jewish neighbors. It's clear, we know that for a fact, because the sages oftentimes had friends acquaintances who were not Jewish, commoners, noblemen. So it's not to be estranged from them and not to like them and be friends and be good neighbors and whatever with the non-Jewish world. However, there has to be a mental safeguard and a distinction to keep our minds and responsibilities in the world as clear as possible. Because we have a unique mission in this world, that being a good person isn't enough when you're a Jew. You also have to infuse the world with holiness. It's hard. So in order to keep your eye on the ball, in order to keep our eye on the ball, and keep ourselves in sync with our mission, we have to, in some areas of our life, have a certain boundary, that we don't participate in certain things. There's three verses in the Torah that talk about our need to not go in the ways, or all the ways of our neighbors. Number one is found in Vayikra Leviticus. It says you should not go in the way, in the actions and the statutes of the land of Canaan. You can see it on your papers. Um, the second one is also found in Vayikra, also in Leviticus. It says, I have separated you from the nations. Okay, I've separated you. I've made you different. You're different. Not better, not worse. Just different. You have a different mission in this world. You have a different prescription for life. And the third is caution, caution yourself lest you be pulled in their ways. That's from Dvarim, the book of Deuteronomy. Okay? The Rambam, the famed medieval sage Maimonides, when he's codifying this in Jewish law, says that we have to be different in our actions, in our knowledge, our ideology, and our understanding of things. What are some practical ways in which we are meant to be just a bit different? The Medrash tells us that when the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt, it was in merit of a few things. Okay? Number one, they didn't change their names. They kept their Jewish names, their Hebrew names. Number two, they kept their language. Hebrew was their language. And they didn't change their clothing as well. They, stayed, they made themselves dress a little bit different than their surroundings as well. You know, it's interesting just as an as interesting an anecdote, um, in the 1960s, when a lot of Jewish people were being pulled towards cults or the Eastern religions or to hippieism, hippieism in particular, a lot of the hippies, when they would learn Torah, so they would want to embrace it. They, they said, wow, you know, this, 
all, all, all this love and you know, peace that we're looking for, that we're searching for, is really all in the Torah. If I pursue a Torah life, I can have that love and peace and, you know, groovy, man. The world is great. So a lot of them pursued getting back to their roots and becoming more involved in their Judaism. Now, a lot of people in the religious world were a little bit standoffish. You know, who are these, you know, long-haired weirdo people who all of a sudden want to become, you know, part of our community? And one person who turned the, the tide and looked at it in a completely opposite direction was the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he said that when the Jews were redeemed from Egypt, one of the things that made them worthy of redemption was they didn't change their name, and they had their own language, and they had their own clothing. Look at these hippies. They have their own language. Groovy, dude. They have their own clothing. You ever see the tie-dye, whatever? And they had their own names. They had their own names for each other. So he said the same reason that they are redeemable, that they are worthy and able and should be encouraged to come back, is the same reason that God took us out of Egypt in the first place. They want to be different than their surroundings. They're looking for a better tomorrow. They're looking for a, a, a more a deeper connection with life. Let's show them the real deep connection with life. So the language, names, and clothing. The language separated them from the Egyptians and kept them away from idolatry. If you're speaking predominantly a different language, it'll keep you out of the dearth of the culture. A Jewish name is very important. Okay? Our tradition teaches, and we've discussed it several times, that when a parent names their child in the Jewish name, they're given a glimmer of divine intuition. The Arizal, the most famous, famous Kabbalist, perhaps of all time, said that the name of a person, the Jewish name of a person, is the channel of divine energy unique to that person. So by naming a person one name will direct a certain energy mold toward that person as opposed to naming them something else. It's a big deal, a Jewish name. A big deal. The Maram Shik says that a person who has a non-Jewish name, he goes to the, the, opposite, the opposite extreme, says that someone who has a non-Jewish name is violating the idea of going in the path of the non-Jews, of the Gentiles. Now, whether that's the actual halacha, whether that's the actual law or not, not that's for, not for tonight to decide, but just to emphasize this idea of how important a Jewish and uniquely Jewish name is. And to go by a Jewish name. That a Jewish name shouldn't be just the thing that we have on our wedding certificate, or in our ksuba, and on our death certificate. It should be something that we know, that we live by, and we try and live up to. And the last thing was clothing. In Judaism, one of the things, as a Jew, we always have to have some sort of Jewish dress of distinction. You know, for example, in Talmudic times, the yarmulke, a head covering, wasn't done by everybody. It was something that was more by the pious. Then, it became custom that everybody started wearing it. And nowadays, that when all the other people in the world when they want to show respect, they take off their hats. We have to be different from them, of course, we're Jews, right? And we put on a hat in order to show respect. So a person, a Jew, is always meant to look distinctly Jewish. And I don't mean nose, and I don't mean bald head, or anything like that. We're talking niyamaka, we're talking tzitzes, for women, talking, you know, that you should dress in a modest way, that a person should look down the street and say, oh, there goes a Jew, in a good way. <laughs> There's a dispute 
in the Rishonim, the early authorities, and the Achreinim, the later authorities that codified Jewish law, as to how far the parameters go in which we're supposed to make distinction. In particular, when it comes to celebrations, holidays, and uh, events like that. Everyone agrees that it's forbidden to do anything that's connected with idolatry or immorality. So anything that the world's populace is doing that's connected with either idolatry or immorality, everyone under the sun says that's a no-no for Jews. Can't get involved in that. You can understand why. Idolatry, not so good. Immorality, not so good. Okay, what's, what's got to do with Jews? The Ran and the Maharik say that that's essentially the only practices that are forbidden, only the idolatrous ones. However, there are opinions. Um, Tosfos, one of the Rishonim, one of the early authorities, comments in the Talmud, in the Gemara in Avodah Zara, saying that even a minag shtus, even a, a practice, a custom, a holiday, that's not religiously oriented, has no religious or spiritual ramifications, is also not for a Jew. It's also something that we're meant to distinguish ourselves from. Even one that's not connected with religion or philosophy. A minig shtus, it's just something that everybody does on a certain day for no apparent reason, also not for a Jew. So now knowing these basic parameters, how does this all b apply back to Halloween? If you think about it, everything that Halloween represents is the antithesis of Judaism. Everything it stands for. Halloween's about darkness. Judaism is about light. Halloween's about scaring. Judaism is about kindness. Halloween's about taking, trick-or-treating. Gimme! Judaism is about giving. Halloween's about death. Judaism is about life. What's a Jew got to do with Halloween? We said earlier that Halloween has clear idolatrous beginnings. It was thought to be the most favorable time for divining, divination, a time of superstition, all of which are prohibited in Judaism. It was the only day that the help of the devil was invoked for such purposes. Not so much with Judaism. Later, when the Roman holidays got mishma mishmashed in, wasn't much better. The Roman holidays were far from good, far from Jewish. Many of their holidays had masks as well. The Talmud, also the Gemara and the Zara, tells a very interesting and unfortunate holiday that the Romans would celebrate. It said that once in 70 years they would get together and they have a parade. And this parade would involve a lame man and a healthy man. And the healthy man, the strong man, would sit on top, right on top of the lame man. The strong man represented Esav, Esau, who was the ancestor of Rome. And the lame man represents Yaakov, Jacob, the origin of Israel, of the Jewish people. And it was to show the dominance of Rome, the empire, over the Jews. Not only that, but it says that the strong men would wear a very uh, special mask. What was this mask that he would use? We're well, just coming now from Yom Kippur. Part of the Yom Kippur service, towards the end, we commemorate ten martyrs. Ten martyrs who gave their life for their religion. Ten great sages who were killed just because they were Jews and spreading Torah. One person was Rabbi Yishmael, Rabbi Ishmael. 
He was the high priest. And he was executed by Hadrian. He was one of the ten martyrs. At that time, the daughter of Caesar thought that he was a very attractive man. So before he was killed, or as he was being killed, his face was flayed off of his body and mounted as, a, as, a, as an object of, uh, to, be, uh, to be looked at. An object to be adorned and not worshipped, but to be gazed at. And during this holiday that the Romans would celebrate, the strong man representing Asaph would wear the face, literally the face, of Rabbi Yishmael. Not such a great holiday. Not such great people. Professor John Hennig, in his classical article on the topic of Halloween, demonstrates clear historical relationship between the Celtic celebration, as it once was, then its later Roman adaptation, the later Catholic responses to it, until this modern American holiday that we call Halloween. In the early 1950s, when the Satma Rebbe's wife passed away, the Rebbe, the Lubavitch Rebbe, went to be Menachem Avelhem, went to go comfort him in his mourning. This is the early 1950s. It actually happened right around, within the next uh, month or so, within the next, it was in Cheshvan. One of the things that they discussed, of all topics, they, they discussed a few topics. One of them was the idolatrous ramifications and implications of Halloween. Because Halloween was in that week, so they were talking about the, the ideas behind it. It's no secret that Halloween is associated with idolatry, with paganism, with things completely counterintuitive to the Jewish mind. Although few today celebrate it for those reasons, most people just use it as, as an excuse to get candy, throw eggs at each other, and toilet paper your trees, okay? It would still be prohibited for a Jew to do it due to its known origins. The author of the book Oitzer Kol Minhage Yeshurun, which is a book about the origin of many of our Jewish customs, discusses Halloween and says that it's prohibited for any Jew to partake in it, to celebrate it. It gives many reasons why. But what about participating indirectly? What about trick-or-treaters come to your house? Are you allowed to give them candy? So, ideally, if, you, if a person could avoid it, that might be the best way. If not, there may be, and it's going to cause ill feelings, or you're going to be the cheap Jew, or whatever, it's going to, whatever kind of negative connotations are going to come with it, it there may be some room for, for leniency. Um, it's, I've heard from several sources that Rav Pam, who was a noted uh, scholar, a noted sage in this generation, he was the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the Yeshiva, the Masifta Torah Vadas, it's, I've heard from several people that he did give trick-or-treaters when they, when they came around. Just uh, food for thought. Um, with all other things that we may be tied up with in our life that surround Halloween, if work at work they're having a Halloween party, or if you're a school teacher in a public school and part of the curriculum is Halloween, ask your local Orthodox rabbi how to go about dealing with it. Just, yeah. In Judaism, as we touched on earlier, we're meant to be a light unto the nation. The prophet Yeshaya, the prophet Isaiah, says it's the job of the Jew to serve as a light unto the nations. A light unto the nations, not to be consumed by the nation. Not to assimilate, to illuminate. Again, our job, our purpose, our goal is not to convert but to be ambassadors of God and His Torah in this world. You know, Abraham and the Torah, all of our great, 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 great grandfathers was known as the Ivri, the Hebrew. Why was he known as the Ivri? So 
the Medrash says that Ivri means other side. He stood on one side of the fence, and everyone else in the world at his time stood on the other side of the fence. Part of being the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, part of being a Jew, is being an Ivri. Sometimes, some instances in our life, we have to be on the other side. We're not <coughs> condemning. We're not scornful. We're not arrogant. We don't think that we're better than anybody. It's just not for us. We have to be the example. The Sifri comments on Dvarim, comments in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, just as Abraham caused others to believe in God because of his great love of God, so too our love of Hashem, our service of Hashem, should be so great that it causes others to love Him as well. We don't have to go out and proselytize. We don't have to go out and tell people that they're doing the wrong thing and that they shouldn't be doing this and that. Our job is just to have love of God exuding from us. Service of God exuding from us. Morality exuding from us. Everything that Torah represents exuding from us. Just as a candle doesn't have to force its light on its surroundings, it just happens that way. We have no idea the impact that we cause when we're acting as a Jew should, the impact that it makes on our circle of influence, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, no idea. In fact, you see, most of the time, when a Jew is acting as a Jew should, his non-Jewish friends, neighbors, acquaintances, co-workers, Facebook friends, all all have nothing but the utmost respect and admiration for his or her beliefs and doesn't want to do anything that's going to infringe on them. Rav Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, noted scholar in the late 19th century, says in his 19 letters, in the midst of a world which worships wealth and lust, Israel, the Jewish people, if they were to live a tranquil life of righteousness and love, if while everyone else and everywhere else, the generation of man is rapidly sinking into the depths of sensuality and immorality, the Jewish sons and daughters should bloom forth in the splendor of youth, purity, and innocence. What a powerful influence for good the Jewish people would have on the world. That's our purpose here. Our purpose here is really to be examples. Not just to be good people, that's part of it. We have to be good, that's the first step. But our job is also to bring down holiness, not only to our life, but to make our candle shine forth to our surroundings. In order to stay alight, burning strong to our surroundings, one has to stay warm themselves. A person can't be a light shining to others if we're not fanning our own fire. The more mitzvahs that we do, the more positivity we bring to our own life, the brighter and hotter our own fire will shine. The book of Proverbs, Mishle, says that the soul of a person is the lamp of God. Have we been making our lamp burn? The lamp can never go out. The flame, the spark of godliness within each and every one of us can never go out. But in order for it to shine brighter and burn hotter and influence more and keep ourselves warm as well, we have to keep adding fuel. We need another mitzvah and another mitzvah and then another mitzvah and then more learning, and then more doing, until we exude godliness, we exude purity, and we exude light. Our candle can burn, our light can shine, that when all the floodwaters and strong winds 
of life start churning, the candle must protect itself from those outside influences. This is why the Jew, in, in, in certain instances in our life, both by celebration of what, what the rest of the world around us is doing, and by customs of what the rest of the world around us is doing, a Jew has to keep themselves warm a little bit. A Jew has to keep the fire going. A Jew has to make sure that all those winds, the tumultuous winds, aren't going to cool his fire, but are going to strengthen his fire. This week's meditation, if you take a look at your paper, and a review of what we've talked about tonight, number one is consider the origin of the customs of Halloween. Think then about what it means to be a Jew, a shining candle who infuses the world with holiness and shines light to the outside world. Did the two go together? Think about areas in your life where you let yourself get off track from the universal Jewish mission. Not just Halloween, but everyone should think that to themselves this week, where are areas in my life where I'm getting pulled away from this mission, this Jewish mission of being a shining light in the world? Or of fanning my own fire through doing more mitzvahs? And then, instead of eating candy, instead of egging your neighbor's yard, do something this week that strengthens your inner, uniquely Jewish light. Have a wonderful night.